Foreshadowing, especially when it's subtle, is probably one of my favorite aspects of storytelling. Like this. There's something so satisfying about watching a plot unfold and then looking back and realizing all the signs were there from the start. It's like the author's daring you to catch on, challenging you to piece things together before the big reveal hits. And in Jujutsu Kaisen, foreshadowing is masterfully used to build suspense and depth, making each twist feel not only earned, but inevitable. As if the story was leading you to that exact moment, you just didn't know it yet. When foreshadowing is used to justify an outcome in hindsight, it feels for me like getting insulted with a really impressive burn. Either it's something that I take the L for immediately and something I gotta respect despite my initial opposition, or it's something I come around to after the exchange is over. But no matter what, it requires a solid skill in some form of delivery, like freestyling, sleight of hand, or storytelling to pull off. Jujutsu Kaisen is full of foreshadowing and underlying consistency. It's also full of a bunch of insults to readers who haven't read Naruto first. But I imagine they're really there to be mad at whoever reads JJK after having read the plot of Naruto and isn't taking Naruto's lessons to heart. I mean, if you've read Naruto or even Attack on Titan since that's come out, and you haven't kept the actual real-world valuable life lessons on understanding other people's perspectives, the limits to justifiably seeing others as objectively in the wrong, or how there are objective benefits to making cooperation work, so everything you read that builds on those ideas has to spell it out for you and reinvent the wheel, then yeah, I'd be pretty mad at you too. So I really can't blame the writer of JJK for expecting the audience to be keeping those lessons from existing shows in mind when they read it to pick up on all the clear indications that the story is following those fields of thinking, and then deliberately making bad ends and punishments like favored character deaths for the readers who ignore that subtext. But JJK has a unique trick in storytelling, at least one I haven't seen elsewhere. It's sort of in the same family as foreshadowing, but not quite. Nanami's death, the Gojo clock, and Sukuna's middle finger are all examples of the story using punishments to natural selection style prune the ways people have read it, and more importantly, share the ways of reading it to others. Because having the larger conversation of your work be hijacked by a bunch of people misreading it would be the opposite of progress when it comes to delivering any sort of message an author might want to. <coughs> But also, entertainment-wise, this story is not a visual novel, so it can only provide details and tell itself linearly, and can only ever be optimized for one way of reading it anyways. So this trick does encourage people to change their ways of reading JJK and approach it the right way, as long as they're not too stubborn. <clears throat> Sorry, I got something stuck in my throat. Anyways, I'd say since it's a technique designed to allow a story to build on existing messages, rather than forcing any new story to reinvent and cover the same basic broad introduction to a message, it's a really cool and helpful technique, even if it's a little harsh. But it's something that makes sense for being in the arsenal of the same creator who's able to use lines and panel size for emphasis and story beats that other series usually need dedicated extra visual indicators for. It demonstrates a level of fluidity and creativity in manga storytelling that allows a masterful creator to go beyond the basic approach of simply telling a story to an audience, and naturally including what ended up being labeled as different types of techniques. Foreshadowing, or distinctly hinting at something before it happens, is often used in three major ways. One is obvious foreshadowing, so you're emphasizing something but hiding whether it actually happens or what the context is for the clear foreshadowing. The second is world building, where you have hidden details that in something like a rewatch or deliberate analysis becomes clear and indicates extra connections that aren't crucial to the main linear storytelling. Or we have the last one, resolution, where you've included distinct moments that become decipherable in hindsight, but are immediately recalled in the audience's minds, because they were for the sake of justifying some kind of twist or concluding a scene with an earned payoff. And in JJK, all three of these happen throughout. For the first type, think of Kenjaku pointing out how Sukuna had to be scheming something for his return, involving some student he'd taken an interest in, which eventually turned out to be the possession of Megumi's body. Or think how they kept mentioning Shibuya until that whole incident eventually happened. For the second type, think of Megumi always preparing to use Maharaga in his fights before Shibuya, and how that ended up explaining his wider mindset towards fights. 
and hinted at his pessimistic flaws that would become integral to certain strategies and turning points later on. For the third type, think of Sukuna first using his domain to fight in the juvenile detention center. We see the special grade curse immediately split into several pieces. And while all of Sukuna's sorcery feels arbitrary and confusing, it then makes so much sense when his abilities are revealed later on. Sukuna causes cutting effects, and while they can use the ethereal nature of Jujutsu to be thrown through matter, they can also use the added complexity and control granted over a target when being able to make physical contact with it, similar to what Mahito's base technique uses to function, in order to automatically divide a target with a number of cuts based on the amount of cuts it can guarantee for that level of cursed energy resistance from a target. The domain expansion used then bypasses that restriction of needing to make physical contact with a target in order to use Jujutsu of higher complexity now that it's in closer proximity to your direct cursed energy. Because domains paint an entire space and automatically trap everything inside the ongoing circuit and activity of a cursed technique, alright, anyways. Most of the balancing in JJK, or when new techniques are explained, is through context like this, even when it's not specifically foreshadowing. Like, if general base principles or specific character behaviors are used as potential references or justification for something later on. For instance, look at how the Angel's ambiguously described technique was beaten by Sukuna in the past, and then knowingly in the arsenal of the opponents he then judged he could afford to flex on. So it's not surprising he could take Jacob's ladder once, and based on how we saw him tank it, it wasn't surprising he could exploit its external consequences, using the debris it generated as platforms to jump up. But even though everything is carefully justified, foreshadowing or not, when a specific emphasized detail ends up being foreshadowing, I always get that much more of a kick out of it. I think my favorite example has to be, out of all of them, when Uraume guaranteed their team's loss in the final battle. By making the same pose and type of statement Gojo did when he predicted his victory over Sukuna after escaping the prison realm. Urame's version of <laughs> not I'd win is totally a way of foreshadowing Sukuna's upcoming loss. Or a form of jinxing Furnace right as the attack is being unleashed. And honestly, it's super funny. Rip Choso though, but anyways. Jujutsu Kaisen masterfully uses foreshadowing to enrich its storytelling, giving weight to its plot twist and character arcs. It's not just about hinting at future events, but about weaving clues throughout the narrative that reward attentive readers. This technique builds anticipation, deepens the world building, and creates satisfying payoffs, making the audience rethink earlier moments in light of new developments. The series doesn't simply rely on shock value for its twists. It uses foreshadowing to make those moments feel earned. When key events unfold, they often feel inevitable in hindsight, which adds another layer to its storytelling. It challenges its audience to engage critically, rewarding those who pick up on the subtle details while still delivering surprises. Ultimately, this use of foreshadowing showcases its skill in crafting a story that keeps readers on their toes, while building towards a larger, cohesive narrative. But anyways guys, that's the end of the video. As per usual, I'll leave some clips of some audio. Enjoy. Guys, guys, I think we should all agree the first person to take out is the imposter. Right? I agree, they are right? pretty yeah. Yeah. Yeah, wait, is there a fucking gorilla in here? Yeah, there is. I forgot about it. Where the fuck? The imposter is dead! No more false prophets! You trying to cook a bomb real quick? Hold on. I'm just trying to marinate it. I'm good. I'm. Oh, okay. All according right, to plan, this, baby. This is, this all, according to plan. all according to plan. All according to plan. I threw, I, I threw the bomb. I threw the bomb over there so it moves your body, right? And then I hit you because you're uh, fish like a box. No, I fucked it up. I fucked it up. What is this? I don't know what I made. Uh, this was supposed to be a pizza, but I think this is just a warm, a warm towel now. So, uh. Open wide? There you go. Oh, all right. You're just taking it like a like a. Okay, there you go. go. <laughs> Were you about to say like a good boy? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. All right. I, I'm gonna sit down. I know him too tired. well.
I think you're going crazy. On the okay. <laughs> oh my fucking god. Yo! What do you mean? I thought Who won it? <laughs> Alright, ghost game! Let me in! Let me in! Let me in! Okay. Start game. It worked!